thank you very much for being here take it off uh, thanks ashwin thanks dr tetyal and a very good morning to all the chairs and all the speakers and to all the listeners and the viewers uh, so i was asked uh, a difficult topic to speak on in 7 minutes that's premium ios which is like you know i could you know we should probably be writing a book on that or you know have a full day to discuss but i'll try to make the best of it and i think uh, what uh, the talk was intended was to kind of introduce where we stand as far as premium ios go and uh, what are the options and why we should be adopting them if we haven't yet adopted them that's what i'm going to limit myself to and uh, is my screen screen shared uh, ashwin yeah. uh, yes yes is there i'll just yeah. try to see if my yeah okay so can you see my presentation now i'll Correct. is it is it in the full screen mode ashwin okay yes, great yes, yes, so Uh, I was going to talk about premium IOLs, and uh, so I have no financial interest. Uh, let's see. You know, we all understand that how IOLs first came into being with the chance discovery by Harold Ridley, with that PMMA thing going into the you know eye and being tolerated, and that's where the first lens started, almost mm -hmm. little less than a hundred years back. And uh, we've come a long way. And why should we be talking today about premium IOLs in the first place? What has changed over the last 50, 60 years that today we are talking about premium IOLs? And frankly, what are premium IOLs? So I think uh, what's really changed in the last 20 years is patient expectations and quality of life uh, have changed. And refractive surgery procedures like LASIK and SMILE and ICLs, hyping uh, freedom from glasses, have shaped the expectations of uh, cataract surgery patients as well. So, in emerging countries and in the developed world, developed world, the paying capacity of patients has uh, allowed them and given access to better and premium procedures. So, they are willing to kind of spend a little more, just like they spend on their phones. And patient expectations, frankly, have changed. So, they include higher success rate. They want lower complications. They want excellent, uncorrected visual acuity outcomes, and they obviously want reduced dependency on glasses in various activities. And uh, that's where premium miles come in. So, cataract surgery, uh, cataract surgeons categories can be redefined now. So, there is the old school cataract surgeons or the traditional cataract surgeons who are content with what they are doing. They do not really worry about reducing the dependency on glasses. They are just happy to get a good-looking eye and you know a nice eye in the back, and uh, you know happy with that. They would mostly be implanting the monofocal eye wells, and they may not be so keen or receptive to newer procedures or technology. They are happy with what they are doing. And then there is the other category of the refractive cataract surgeons who um, let me just minimize this one moment. I think my slide zoomed in a bit. Okay. So the refractive cataract surgeons who are very very keen about astigmatism correction they look into that very keenly offer a range of cataract procedures suitable for different patient categories they may also be co performing lasik or smile or maybe not uh, you know most cataract surgeons would uh, probably be doing their cataract surgery with this uh, refractive thing aspect in mind and then there are the multifocal iol experts who have been very keen on the new types of multifocal iols available to us and they are pretty happy to explore the newer technology and procedures towards getting happier and happier patients so with that uh, in mind uh, the evolution of premium eyes over the years the types of premium eyes that i have used in my practice over the years and here i limit myself not to the monofocal premiums because there is a range of premium monofocals now but i'm going to restrict myself to other lenses so we started off with the sion uh, kind of multifocal pmma lenses way back about more than 20 years back and went on to the you know twin set which was from acrylisa which was subsequently acquired by zeiss and taken way further with the new platforms and then the you know the spheric and then the aspheric multifocals the accommodating lenses which came in the way and which eventually could not really accommodate and then we've had a lot of um, you know lots of bifocal lenses with different ad pairs and we evolved from the high ads to the low ads over the years and then we went on to the extended depth of focus lenses and today we are uh, you know also into big way into trifocal so that's a long way to go and uh, what have we learned along the way it has taught us a lot about the visual functions of all the iols so we know a lot more today of how these iols work and how patients accept them we have also learned how to manage them and how to give quality outcomes to different patients and how to you know add these iols to your practice is key to remaining competitive and differentiating in the modern world of refractive cataract surgery and it's very important to manage patient expectations very well as well so a happy satisfied patient is probably the best word of mouth advertisement for a practice besides what you can achieve with social media and other advertisements so nothing to beat word of mouth 
Now, what's the doctor's role and responsibility in this? Function uh, of the doctor is managing the disease pathology, operating on the cataract, the surgical management of visual function. But patient expectations have to be met because they think that we can solve 100% of their problems, which may not necessarily be true. So what's the solution? Understand the patient's needs, set the right expectations, and deliver the right result by choosing the right procedure. So where to start? I think first thing, if you are not already doing all this, uh, if you are wanting to be a refractive cataract surgeon or want to evolve as a refractive cataract surgeon, raise your standards, perfect your biometry, start getting 90% of your patients within plus minus half of hematropia in your outcomes, pay good attention to astigmatism, do a toric calculation for all your patients, even those with just a 0.5 cylinder, because you'll be surprised by some of them who might still need a toric IOL. So happy emetropic patients will refer a few more. And there is a large choice of presbyopia correcting IELTS now. And let's go on on how we can do this. So tackling astigmatism, I won't go into the details, but one slide to tell you, measure it well. Use all the devices available in your clinic measure. You may have at least two, three devices, an autokeratometer, a handheld, a manual keratometer, maybe a topographer, maybe a optical biometer. You might have one of the Callisto or the Virion kind of devices. You may have an eye trace or another abrometer doing that for you. So look for consistency of measurements. Typically in my clinic, each patient who goes for cataract surgery has four or five measurements for the keratometry and an optical biometry for sure. And that helps us decide. And now we, of course, use the abrometer as well, but it's not necessary to get good outcomes. So do a toric calculation for all your patients. And then when you treat them, I think everybody might agree that toric IELTS now today are the most predictable way of correcting them. So don't hesitate to use a toric IELTS. Of course, there are the other ways. You can do the arcuates. You can do the femto LRIs for small astigmatism. You can make steep meridian incisions. You could do opposing clear corneal incisions. You could do what you want. But for me today, toric aisles probably are the best way. And we have a huge range of toric aisles available. And today Zeiss is doing this symposium. But I use all various company toric aisles. And they are all great. I like the Zeiss ones. I like the ones which come from j, &J from Alcon. And even the Indian lenses today are excellent. So do them, but learn them well. And uh, try to get all your patients, uh, you know, as my, I typically tell my toric patients that we are going to try and bring you below one so that we don't have the wrong expectations. We typically achieve a 0.25 or a 0.5 plus or minus. That's 90% of our patients. Now, correcting presbyopia and understanding your patient, introduce the possibility to every patient who's coming to your cat for cataract surgery from your waiting area for patient education, you know, leaflets from your counselor to the doctor's room. Just let them know that there is a way that you can see for near without glasses. Build up the expectation. Assess each patient's needs. Give full chair time. Give a patient hearing and understand the mindset of the patient, the occupation of the patient, what his needs are. Clear the myths and misconceptions. You know, sometimes when we try to introduce this topic to a patient about presbyopia correcting lenses and the patient say, oh, I don't want to do a multifocal. You know, you might get turned off and say, okay, this guy is not good for multifocal lenses. But I think it's a good way to ask them that why are you against this? You know, try to understand. Maybe he has a friend who has had a bad outcome for some reason which he doesn't understand. So try to clear the myths that, you know, patients may have in their minds. Explain how variant needs may evolve post cataract surgery. See, some patients who are currently myopic because of the cataract, they may be reading very well. So it's very important to tell them that if we go for a monofocal lens, or following surgery, you're going to need glasses for seeing your watch, seeing your phone, reading everything, because they may not understand that what's going to change after surgery. So please take out two minutes to explain to them life after cataract surgery if we are doing a lens with a monofocal or a presbyopic correcting lens. Now, a thorough evaluation, I think I will not go into details at all. Ocular surface, tear film, and very accurate biometry, an astigmatism management plan. Look for coexisting pathologies, a good retina exam if you're doing multifocals, OCT of the macula if possible. If possible, do a topography and abrometry, but they are not necessary. Other considerations. Look at the pupil size, very important. If somebody has a really small pupil size and you put in a lens which has a big central area, the multifocality may not work and may be counterproductive. Look at the patient's arm lens. See if he has long arms, so we might want intermediate vision. Look at if he has short arms or a lady with short arms might be happier with a multifocal or trifocal lens. Look at the corneal sphericity and try to balance that out. Now, each of these topics requires a full presentation, so I won't go into the details. Look at night driving requirements, the personality type. Look at the profession of the patient and plan your lens well. Look at the age of the patient, whether it's a young patient, unilateral surgery, bilateral surgery, whether there's any history of previous refractive surgery, that will help you decide what kind of lens to choose. So uh, I will not go into the depths of this chart, but visual functions are multifaceted and involve so many things. So patient perception of vision being one very important one and the contrast sensitivity. 
So choosing the right IOL for your patient, a range of IOLs is now available and uh, for different needs. One size does not fit all, nor does a lens. There are so many choices, monofocal, monovision. You can have an extended depth lens with monovision. You can have an extended range of vision uh, IOL, bifocals, trifocals, mix and match. So choosing the right procedure is equally important. You could do a FACO or a femto-assisted procedure with LRIs. You could do incision planning, toric multifocals. So counseling and setting the right expectations for your patients is so, so important. The counselor's role is to set the right expectations. So is the doctor's role. Never hype total freedom from glasses. For all activities, tell them that you may still need glasses for occasional work. Discuss about the best results when both eyes are done together. Mention about glare and halos, but don't talk too much about it. You just let them know that almost everybody gets some of them and they mostly go away in 95% of our patients and educate them well. Pick the best candidates for your surgery and pick out the red flags. In our practice, we started multifocus in 2002, torix in 2008. In 2010, just 3 to 4 percent patients were getting multifocus or torix, and only 70 percent were plus minus a half for uh, for their refractive result. In 2012, we acquired an optical biometer. By 2013, 85 percent patients were plus minus half. We had 10 percent practice of torix and 10 percent multifocus. Today. Torics are 30%, multifocals are about 20% of our practice, and another 5% are multifocal torics. And our distribution of multifocals has changed completely in the last two, three years with a big skew towards the trifocals. Almost 80% patients are trifocals, very few bifocals. And I see that bifocals will probably go away. We'll stick to the trifocals because of their excellent results for at, at the three ranges and patient acceptability and lesser incidence of glare and halos. Last slides. Pre dissatisfied premium IL patients, you must watch out for them. Don't kind of disown your patients if they come back dissatisfied. Look at the causes. Could be astigmatism, residual refractive error. Could be the wrong expectations set by us. Please discuss with them. Binocular vision can be a problem. Near difficulty, they may find difficulty reading. Ask them to use good illumination. Difficulty with distance vision has to be sometimes looked at. Glare and halos may be a problem. So how to manage them? Again, a full topic. So only one slide on this and then I finish. Patient hearing to your patients is very, very important. Empathize and reassure. Make sure that you understand them, listen to them, and reassure them. Don't tell them that, okay, this doesn't happen, or even telling them that this happens to every patient can put them away because they may not come back to you. They may get totally disheartened and you know think that nothing can be done about it. So tell them things can happen and we can improve upon it. Look for the potential causes. Counsel about neuroadaptation. Don't lose your patients. Keep, keep talking to them and trying to bring them around. They will, 90% of them will settle down. Maybe do an abrometry if they are not settling down. Try to find a cause. Advise fusion exercises and try to divert the patient's attention from this uh, dissatisfaction to other things. You know, try to divert them to their fixation to other things. It sometimes helps. So ensure the attendant also understands what you're trying to tell them. And as a last resort, this is really important. Give them that option that we can expand this lens and very nicely give you a monofocal with excellent distance vision, but that you're going to start using reading glasses. Some of my patients never came back. They said, okay, we'll manage like this itself and we are happy. So what's the take home message? Cataract surgery has evolved into a refractive cataract surgery. Patient expectations for freedom from glasses after cataract surgery have grown a lot. A wide range of IOs is now available to meet the needs of the doctor and the patients. Diagnostic modalities have kept pace and evolved to get close to perfect outcomes for us. We have better understanding of newer lenses and patient point of view and surgical techniques have come a long way to help us. Good counseling and chair time are the key. Also, last last point, post-COVID slowdown, I think it's a good time to move into refractive cataract surgery if you haven't or to take it to the next level with premium miles because you'll have more time, you'll have less patients, and you're probably going to try to look for better outcomes. Thank you so much. And I think I'll stop sharing my screen. And happy to Thank you, Dr. Gaurav. That was excellent. It was such a precise and to-the-point uh, conversation on premium IOLs. Before I move on to questions from Dr. Jeevan and me will ask uh, the panelists, I think it's important to tell all the audiences, if you have any questions, please put them up on the question uh, on the question list on the GoToWebinar, or you can also put them up on the Facebook and the YouTube live comment section, and we will get all the questions to answer them. We have a lot of time to answer questions now, after each conversation, as well as post all the uh, topics post all the speakers. Uh, I have a few questions that have come. Uh, we'll start with one or two and then we'll take the next topic. So Dr. Rohit, if you can prepare your next your uh, slides up for the next uh, speak for the next presentation. Can you uh, allow me to yeah. the presenter one? Yeah. Okay. Now panelists, uh, Dr. Partha, if you can 
just let us know. Uh, somebody has asked a question. What if I don't have an IOL master or I don't have these premium uh, products? What do I do uh, in those cases to calculate for premium IOL specifically? Uh, I want to give my patients the best result. But what should I do? Right. So very, very valid question because all of us definitely want to get uh, give the best outcome to our patients. But remembering the fact that the best outcome, as Gaurav so rightly said, depends upon the accuracy. So the accuracy of all the parameters is so important that at the overview, when we, one is planning to switch from uh, the normal IOLs to the premium mode of IOLs, everything, uh, the workup should be done so that even if I do not have a particular equipment, it must be available in my locality where a patient can be referred, get a topography done or get the IOL master done and the optical biometry and uh, if required, the abrometry and the topography definitely needs to be done. 100% the OCT uh, needs to be done if uh, the patient uh, does have clear media and good enough media and these are absolute good parameters otherwise the problem would be the blame would come on to the lens and not on the inadequate pre-operative workup that has been which again translates to us as surgeons so i think a proper workup has to be done if one is planning a premium IOL. fantastic uh, Dr. Chi, uh, actually, Dr. John, if you are here, if you can answer one question. Uh, in case of old LASIK patients, do you choose premium IOLs or no? Is a question. Yes, I do. Um, you know, with these optical biometry, they're really quite impressive. And the newer formulas, uh, the, uh, in fact, Ida you know, Barrett has a even a toric formula. So not only am I putting in trifocals, I'm putting in trifocal torics. And I'm getting very nice results. The the new formulas and all the optical biometries is quite impressive. And um, uh, with the newer lenses, um, uh, they're, they're quite good. You know, I think that with the post LASIK, a lot of times the problem is the glare more than the halos. And right. uh, with the newer lenses, uh, we've we've actually um, really avoided that quite a bit. For the higher myops, say about eight diopters or above, I usually just use an EDOF. Like the AT Lara, or you know the 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 you know the 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 worker, weaker ones, but for right. the lower myops, six dobs or below, I use the four trifolds. They work very well. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Ashwin, I just like to add one yes. thing. Ashwin. Yes, what, please. Uh, Doctor Bhatta talked about uh, you know uh, referring the patient to a place where you have uh, devices. I think uh, with economy uh, going down and next few years, it will be tough for all of us. I think the group practice and sharing the you know uh, clinical area would be the future. And that will also will make sure that you have the best equipment for a group of people. I think that should be the uh, thinking of younger generation rather than trying to acquire everything for themselves and difficult to maintain. So I think yes, group sir. practice will be the future. Oh, the Absolutely. only problem Absolutely. is that problem is if you refer the patient to some other place then that some other place will only do it and will not send the patient back to you because that's right. the group practice has to be there then uh, you know yeah. he's capable of doing a premium io himself <laughs> that's right you know, they have a pooled uh, thing you know group like uh, partha knows so, the thing uh, and that I should be the future for the indian practice i think the what, thank you sir what, i think what the jeevan uh, is, is that collaboration is probably the way forward and how you can yeah. mutually uh, exist is something that we have to look at in uh, in the future. If if I may be right in some summarizing that, yeah. Ashwin, I would like to add that you know we never had all these devices, you know, and we've been doing premium miles for 15 years. It's just that we got better. So it, the take-home message should not be that you must do these things to to get a good outcome, even if you don't have an optical biometer. But you can invest a couple of lakhs into a small, better keratometry device, get a good ultrasonic immersion scan. You can still do it, but of course the newer devices make life much easier and better. 
yet you can still achieve 90% good outcomes even with very basic devices should be the take home message so that it doesn't discourage our viewers who don't have these devices that they cannot go on to doing these things i was still doing torix when i did not have an optical biometer it's just that you know i did them but much better subsequently so when possible do add some of the basic devices i think an optical biometer is a must once you can afford it as important as a fake machine or in or in a microscope yet it's not compulsory to have it to do all these things yeah okay. i have a comment have a comment can i say um yes the water immersion actually works quite well they're quite accurate if you don't have an optical biometry and um, if, if you have that maybe start off with the edofs because they're more forgiving uh if you're a little off they're more forgiving uh, they tolerate up to like 1.25 uh, uh adopters of astigmatism whereas with the trifocals they only tolerate three quarters of adopter so you can start off with the edofs and use water immersion and and you know, get a feel for that and maybe hopefully you, you you do enough cases to make enough money to buy an optical uh, uh, you know a barometer a biometer fantastic point john before i move on to dr rohit's talk one last question to dr namrata uh, how many of the regular patients uh, doc do you do for to do topography on them because in regular patients if you are, even if you don't have a premium how do we know if there's an amount of toricity to the cornea and we have to combat that pre -op and Do you do right. in regular patients as well, topography regular, or no? Regular patients we don't do, only when we are, you know, uh, if we, we see in the IOL master that there's some degree of astigmatism and sometimes you need to correlate, I mean, get the correct access or the uh, correct uh, amount of astigmatism. So only, only in those cases we do topography, not for all cases. Fantastic. I think thank you so much panel for helping me in this uh, dr rohit if you can start off your yeah. topic on intumescent cataracts can, can, can they give me access to for the presenter in, yes yeah show my screen yes yeah am i on yes yes, yes. yes. Perfect. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ashwin for coming out with such a stupendous uh, symposium. All of us know that Ashwin is a gem in ophthalmology. He has given me the topic of intumescent cataracts. Well, these intumescent cataracts have the biggest challenge while performing capsulorexis because more often than not, each one of us have ended up with an Argentinian flag sign. The diagnosis of a fluid-filled pearly white intumescent cataract is somewhat made out by the thickness of the lens, which increases anterior-posterior, which can go right up to maybe five millimeter. ACD is subsequently decreased. Slit lamp examination helps. Biometry can help because between the L1 and L2, we have two or three spikes. And OCT, as Dr. Abhinav Dhami has shown, that we find fluid-filled pockets in on OCT images. So anterior segment, those can also help a lot. You know, we have to understand a few basic fundamentals. First is that there's a high intralentricular pressure, number one. And some percentage have three compartments, quite contrary to the morgagging or the other ones. You can see that there is an interior and the and there is the posterior one. This is the interior and the posterior compartment. So these compartments have separate in, contribute separately to the rise of intralenticular pressure. Then the posterior pressure has also to be sorted out. So this posterior pressure is in the form of, you know, we can decrease this by giving mannitol. You know, if by chance, I don't use a uh, block for that matter, but if you are using, use hyaluron, hyalase to spread out that, and as G very often has said, that you know she's coming across patients where exposure is different. So you know the Jaffe speculum really helps a lot. So Jaffe speculum is another important thing. As far as the anterior chamber pressure is concerned, well, we need to take care of that. We need to increase and equalize the pressure in the anterior chamber. A viscocohesive, for that matter, is obligatory and mandatory because it goes in a long way in increasing the pressure in the interior chamber so that it becomes equal or maybe higher than the intralenticular pressure. What is the plan now? Well, if the interior chamber depth is less than 2.3 millimeter, 
my preferred technique is to use a 30 gauge needle aspiration wherein the 30 gauge needle goes in and aspirates so in this video you will find that there is you know it's already trypanview stained the 30 gauge needle goes in visco cohesive is very much in and the uh, outer lip has some visco to so that it doesn't come out the moment you go in that is the time when simultaneously the aspiration has to start you can go with either bevel up or bevel down and you will find that here that it has become a concave structure in the center so with this in mind now what is the next situation the next situation is that in the center what has happened is that there is a concave so the here the pressure is less intralenticular but the area which needs to be sorted out is this area and this area now what do we need to do now so first is don't go to that uh, you know the mid peripheral area how do we do that we create a small rexes and complete it and that too in the central area or you know if you have to make the uh, incision make a micro incision if possible calibrate it and a partial micro incision as dr arun jain from pgi has shown all over how he does it see how i am not going fully in and with the micro forceps because you do not want the pressure in the anterior chamber to decrease by any means so once that is done life becomes easier now if we have to in cases wherein the anterior chamber depth is more than 2.3 2 i prefer to use a micro incision and a micro forceps for that matter but the most important thing is you know we have to give the direction to the initiation because if we don't give a curved direction it will there's a propensity of it to go and go to the periphery next important thing is which we have started doing now is is the reverse angled initiation now what is this reverse angled initiation you pull it towards yourself see again you pull it puncture it and pull it slightly towards yourself now how does this help see how it will help now when we create a reverse nick it comes directly under your excess even if you are trying to you know struggle around it is direct and directly under you and you can very well complete a small rexus by that matter you can see now how you know the uh, the the capsule is bouncing this shows by all means as dr chi always says see the bouncing and that will let you know that it is an intumescent cataract for that matter next again because she has done so much of work i cannot but uh, salute her for so many things next thing which she does is which can be brought into practice is the cortical milking what do you do in cortical milking from the mid periphery you squirt out the fluid towards the center so that the mid periphery doesn't remain the red zone it comes into the orange zone in the covered terms so next is debulking and decompartmentalization what we do is we want to do this taking into care the brazilian so that there are no two compartments the anterior and posterior and at the same time you are aspirating it you will see how it is being done you use the side ports to your advantage when you are using side ports to your advantage you are pushing and the nucleus also and which creates an a, a fluid which allows the fluid from the posterior compartment to come to the anterior segment and we are able to take care of that now once all this is done the ccc can be enlarged to even such a large you know uh, 2.8 mm incision for that matter so you can see how easily with all central and mid peripheral uh, you know the pressure taken control of you can easily complete a rexis for that matter yes we have been using pre operative yag laser in quite a few cases that can be done 30 minutes before surgery and you can use diamox also because at times there can be some bit of rise of pressure and because the fluid when it comes out the intralenticular pressure decreases and see how easily you can complete the rexis irrespective of the fact whether it was a was a you know an intumescent cataract for that matter uh, the great mohan rajan pancho rexis for that matter you know he has been using it i have tried it and i find it's good but somehow it has not taken my fancy you have to use a longitudinal one no ozil for that matter uh, a zero degree uh, tip has to be used and if you are successful in creating that you can complete the rexis without any problem whatsoever
Next is, you know, at times we think that it is an intumescent one and we find that, you know, it is, we are easy and we can complete the rexes, then you can, you can spiral it around. So I, this is a very old video and I've been doing spiral where I find that, you know, uh, it is not really uh, intumescent with the cortex fully liquefied. So the basic fundamentals involved are you reduce posterior pressure, increase interior chamber pressure, decompress central area, create a small rexis, reduce mid peripheral and posterior compartment pressure and complete the rexis. Well, let's see some pearls. Reverse interior opening, it is trying to extend, but since it was directly under my uh, view and my scope of uh, doing controlling things, now where do we put the visco? You put the visco where I put so that it doesn't extend and then you can complete the rexes the, in this intumescent cataract for that matter. You know, why did Argentinian flag sign help here, uh, happen here? Well, the patient was squeezing the eye. It was not a micro incision. A visco dispersive was used and non-calibrated and CN was basically the cause for this. Well, despite this, we can still end up with an Argentinian flag sign. Well, if the flap, I'll make it very short. If the flap here is fluttering, as you can see, those stripe and blue stained flap, if it is fluttering, it means it is pre-equatorial. And if it stops fluttering, this means it is post-equatorial by all means. So post-equatorial, it means you have to convert for that matter. Now, with this flap motility sign, you know, you can see now it has stopped fluttering. So this means it has become a post-equatorial. The surgeon continue. So we can know the site of IOL implantation in these intumescent cataracts with Argentinian flag sign. You know, an intraocular lens with fluttering, you can put an, an intraocular lens in the bag. The end point of safe frequent emulsification, we can also know in these cataracts. When the moment it stops fluttering, that is the end point. And is that because this appears much before the classical signs of posterior capsule rupture. MFMS manifestation, well, you really do not know what to do. You know, when you put in the visco, in a good percentage, you will find here that the flap has become averted, but it becomes 100% manifested. The moment you in, in, introduce fluidics, you will see how the fluidics are introduced and the flap has started fluttering. So with this done, then, you know, we at the same time, we have to go in for the safe vacuum emulsification technique. Site of incision is important, low fluidics, stable chamber settings, reduce separational forces, reduce rotation, direction of separational forces in the direction of fear, and use a supra capsule opacification. This is a very short video, and you will find that I'm not trying to separate more using stable chamber settings, not going 90 degree to the uh, plane of the anterior capsular tear for that matter, and you will find how the capsular axis will be completed. With the flax, you know, it that has really helped a lot. You can see this volcanic eruption. So this helps a lot. So in intumescent cataracts, they have their own role. Here you will find what is there is that with even with the white cataract, there is fragmentation. And you do not use the pinching technique. Here we take the benefit of tout and go all around with the tripen view stain. Here you will see what is happening is it's almost, you know, fragmented. So this fragmentation is become so simple and so easy to perform. But that doesn't mean that if you don't have flax, you will not be able to do because with the techniques which I've explained, there is hardly any incidence of Argentinian flax sign for that matter. So the last but not the least, if the plan doesn't work, change the plan, but never the goal. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rohit, for that amazing presentation. I think every little aspect and detail was mentioned there. Dr. Jeevan, any words before I go into questions? I think uh, Rohit uh, has described beautifully the how to tackle the uh, difficult situation. And what I foresee in, uh, in this lockdown period, you will have more such patients coming up uh, in future, and they'll have to be <laughs> taken care of uh, more of uh, such cases. But yes, uh, apart from doing all those techniques, what uh, we have described also, what I do personally is do an intraop assessment of all cases with, if you have a microscope which has an OCT attachment, so you can see the entire dynamics of a capsule which Rohit beautifully described, the pressure induced by the viscoelastic, how the flattening occurs, 
what type of hydration of a cortical matter or a cortex which is behind the capsule then you can plan your surgery accordingly so that anti segment oct can also give you those details if you see my uh, publication jcr is now it's online the entire thing can be delineated you have a uh, various types of uh, intervention uh, catheter raised lenticular pressure and you can design your surgery accordingly which uh, rohit has described each technique uh, beautifully fantastic i, uh, I read your I... paper in jcrs yeah. that was too good dr jeevan yeah, i I think uh, that was awarded also uh, by the American Academy of Ophthalmology as the best video, and that gives very clearly, you know, that some why in some cases the fluid just exudes out, and why in other cases uh, it doesn't. And if you can preempt beforehand, and I think I don't know, I think sir can uh, comment on that. Can anterior segment OCT, which is a high definition and not intraoperative, be a good substitute for? you know pre op evaluation of those kind of cases at least you will yes, come yes, to definitely. see the yeah. definitely this can delineate entire picture as you can see in intra operative also and you can plan your surgery accordingly intra op only it tells you how much you know pressure how much flattening the capsule occurs after release of a fluid what happens to the capsule those can be you know seen better otherwise if you have a good high definition uh, definition anterior segment oct that can give you a beautiful picture and then plan your surgery accordingly uh, you can choice your you know steps also thank you very much dr jeevan going to this going to some questions and meanwhile dr soon if you can uh, also have your presentation ready we'll go with a few questions uh, also this uh, reminds sorry me I, I can't share my screen because i'm i think there's six people on the webcam yeah okay they'll give you the right. access so okay, I have that's great. Thank you. So just, so just to uh, summarize, uh, the yeah, they'll give you the access, Dr. Soon. Uh, to the audiences, please uh, put in your questions as many as you want. I know I'm getting a lot of them on the side, so keep them coming. Uh, some questions is is the madam, uh, Dr. Namrata, this is actually towards you. Is femtosecond a good technology to use in these intumescent cataracts? And how do you do it? What is the plan of action over there? So, so if I you think can it just. Is a, it is a great tool to have, uh, especially for white cataracts, because it does uh, prevent the Argentinian uh, flag from happening. And I think there's an article which, again, Professor Tetial uh, sir, has written on femtosecond cataract uh, guided. Uh, uh, white cat uh, femtosecond uh, cataract surgery in white cataracts. So you can precisely uh, tailor your uh, the size of your rexes without actually you know uh, having it doesn't get extended. That is the most important thing. Right. Uh, even if intra lenticular pressure is high, so it is definitely it has a advantage uh, over conventional uh, technique that you do. Fantastic, uh, Doctor. Dr. Partha, if you can answer this question, how do you know when to stop pulling on the rexus maneuvers and start cutting with scissors in case these become fibrotic? Some of these cases come off as fibrotic, and in those cases, how do you? I mean, I think it's a very interesting question, but you can just tell us. Very, what very interesting, important question, because the fibrosis in per se in a, in the anterior capsule in one of these intumescent cataracts can be very, very mystifying because it might not be in, uh, very visible while the slit lamp by microscopy is on and preoperatively. So it is usually when the stain is there and uh, one realizes that the rexis is not moving and there is a fibrotic element in the anterior capsule. It is at that point of time without pulling at the rexis any longer to come from the side port and snip that part of the capsule which is fibrotic. Then going again beyond the fibrotic area again with the forceps or with the micro forceps and here the micro scissors as well as the micro forceps both hold a lot of promise and should be done. So up to the whole limit of the fibrotic element has to be snipped. At times the fibrotic element can be large and thereby you have to go from the either side and snip so that you are not actually uh, pulling on the fibrotic element because a fibrotic element can never be pulled and it will either run off to the periphery or uh, the zonules might get detached. 
Fantastic. Okay, Doctor, thank you, Dr. Partha. That was fantastic. That was great small tips which are going to really help a lot in actual surgery. Uh, Dr. John, could you answer one question which I think is very interesting? If an Argentinian flag sign does happen, I think it's a two-part question, and I'm just mm -hmm. going to say it the way I understand it. Uh, if, if we have an Argentinian flag sign, do you still put in a premium IOL, one? And second is, Pre-operatively, do you even counsel for premium IOLs in these cases? Um, I, yes, I usually say, you know, there is a chance of that Argentinian flag. Uh, I would definitely use the femto because the femto definitely decreases the chances a lot. And uh, I said, you know, I no promises. I'll do my best. I'll try. Uh, and it, it's worked out very well. You know, I do have, uh, if you don't have the femto, uh, Dr. Prakash actually said it had a very good thing. When you're doing the CCC, you can do it like a reverse traction. They do that, the pediatric ophthalmologists do that. So they make the CCC pulling actually in the opposite direction. And that right. actually much better, much less likely for that, that, that uh, CCC go out and become an Argentinian flag. Right. Uh, okay, that's it. I think these are the questions for now. We'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Soon Fek Chi will be talking from Singapore. Uh, Dr. Soon on small pupil. Go ahead. Screen now. You can yes. you can see my screen. Yes. yes, full screen. Okay. So Sorry, I, I don't know why it's... Okay, so some causes of small pupil, commonly seen diabetics, uveitis, people on drugs, elderly. And so when we see a patient with a small pupil, we look out for posterior synechia, posterior peripheral anterior synechia membranes. And in this case, we don't have any. It's just a small pupil that's not adherent. We have to stop the anticoagulants to make sure we have longer uh, corneal tunnel. And you can see in this case here, uh, the iris is also very, very floppy, and this is not uncommon, especially when we deal with diabetics, although this happened to be a uveitic patient. And as you go along these irises, they, you know, they, they cause lens iris diaphragm retro syndrome, like what we're seeing here, and you can see the iris really going from large to small. So perhaps, you know, doing this case without the aid of some hooks or a pupil retainer was not such a good idea, all right? Although I thought that we could still uh, complete this case quite safely. Now, if you have a small pupil, you can always start off by intracameral adrenaline of this uh, one in uh, 100,000 dilution, give lignocaine 2% preservative free. And then if the pupil dilates, but not adequately, we can just use some viscoelastic. But in this case here, it's adherent. And I like the Coughlin poke because the push and pull poke, which can push away all these adhesions. At the same time, you can also use it to pull, to release the adhesions, and not just at the pupil edge, but also over the broad posterior surface of the iris. And then I like to remove these membranes so that the pupil can dilate evenly. And if that's not adequate, you can use two crooked hooks to gently, carefully retract the iris in opposite directions, but not towards the incision. I'm going to show you the use of iris hooks. This pupil is really small. I've already unbound the pupil by releasing the posterior synechia here. And look at the position of the paracentesis. They are in a diamond form, sub and across. All right, so this is uh, taught to us by Thomas Oyeting, who suggested that the best position to actually have the hook is really under the sub incisional area so that it does not uh, get chafed against the uh, phaco needle as we do the phaco. And you can see here, this pupil is starting to, when I try to expand it a little further, it starts to rip here. And so I'm a bit worried because this is a chronically inflamed iris and it does not stretch nicely all right this fibrous tissue and that doesn't stretch unlike muscle so in this case this is the time to do sphincterotomy so just small ones just at the sphincter so that the pupil can still remain reactive after the surgery and the pupil will still remain round and you can see we slowly titrate the size we can adjust the size and that's a good thing about iris hooks because you don't have to stretch it all the way out you may not need such a big incision as you saw uh, Rohit also mentioned that micro incision, which I used here so that the iris wouldn't give me trouble when I start to manipulate. 
This is the end. You can see a nice round pupil. Now, if you had forgotten and you had created a square uh, kind of a pupil, you can always add this fifth iris hook which comes in the pack. Right, just start positioning it here to go a little more vertically downwards. If you see a membrane, you can see a PI created here. This was totally occluded. I used just a uh, Kawai forceps, which is a micro forceps for capsule axis. And I just pick very carefully initially at the edge of the pupil. And then once you lift off the pupil, you then grab the membrane. All right, be very careful what you're grabbing so that you don't grab and tear iris. There may be a bit of bleeding, but that's okay as long as the patient's not anticoagulants. And then you can slip off these frills so that you have a nice round pupil at the end after your surgery. I'm going to show you the use of a Bila pupil dilator, which is something which you can reuse uh, uh, for each case and the patient doesn't have to pay for the additional cost of a device. So this goes through a 2.6 mm incision, but we have those that go through 2.2 mm incisions that are multiple coagulant hooks which you insert into the eye very carefully and then they come out in a fashion that you'll see looks a bit triangular and awkward. So you're putting all these coagulant hooks on the edge of your foot and helps to put just some viscoelastic underneath before you engage the hooks. All right, and it looks strangely triangular, but you will see once you put in the OVD, the pupil actually expands very beautifully and is round and it's a good size. All right, and you don't need other devices. I'm going to show you what I commonly use, a pupil expander and a retainer, which is a Belugan ring. Unfortunately, I do not have the BHEX available to me in Singapore. So you can see here, I'm just removing the membrane as I always do so that with a Belugan ring or any other pupil retainer, it actually becomes round, all right? If you don't do this important step when you put in a Malukian ring, you'll find that the ring is not sent to the eye. So it helps again to put some viscoelastic under the pupil before you do this step. And I like to retract the iris near the substitutional area with the iris coagulant uh, uh, hook so that we do not have to push this device into the corner just across. And this is at the end of it. Again, this is a little tricky. You need to release it retract it, and compress the two rings. And as it comes out, be careful because the Asian iris can be rather thick and can be trapped by that last ring. Now I'm going to show you a smaller pupil. That was the first version of Malukin version. The first version thicker, the ring or proline. But in this case here, it is made with five or proline, so it's thinner. It can go through a 1.8 mm incision. Use a 6.25 mm ring rather than 7 mm ring for these small pupils. Now you can see here, its patient has got a band keratopathy and it's difficult to see clearly. This is retracting the ring. Please do not pull out the injector without uh, the, uh, retracting the ring first. And you can see it can be a little difficult to get this on because pupil was so small, right? You may need a second instrument to help. And again, it helps to have a coconut hook retract the iris. And you can see here, getting on the final ring. So don't be uh, disappointed if you can't get them all on simultaneously. You can do them one by one. And then finally, again, retracting it, compressing the two rings as they come together and releasing that part of the iris before you pull. Now I'm going to show you a disaster with the Malukin ring uh, 2.0. So this again is a really small pupil and I like to zoom up really to high magnification so I can see what I'm pulling. Whoops, I pulled a bit too much and that was a posterior pigmented leaf. All right, so be very careful. So again, I'm trying to release any kind of posterior sinicia and put in some OBD just on the pupil. Now look at the ring go in and the pupil size. And this you can see is a very flexible ring. It doesn't always obey you, right? So this is the 2.0 version of Malugin ring is still a 6.25 mm device. It expands pupil to that size, but you can see I'm struggling to get it on. Now fast forward it so that you don't have to see me struggle so much and for so long. All right, so I finally got that on and I'm struggling with the final one. Oh, what am I going to do? So I use forceps and a coagulant hook and that really helped to get this on. And finally it was fine, but I struggled. So you should have raised hooks, I said to myself, that would have been much easier. Now at the end, you've had a small capsule rexis and the pupil expands much better after the hour ends. Please expand uh, the capsule rexis. 
So always release perfect anterior sinica before posterior sinica. Always make sure that you use a device that is suitable for the size of your pupil. And thank you very much. Dr. Chi, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. Thank you. Amazing. Again, Amazing. if you still have questions, audiences, please send in your questions. We are still getting a lot of questions. And I'll keep them going. Dr. Jeevan, do you have any comments before I go into the questions more? Well, uh, I would like to put a question to Dr. Chi. Uh, how do we decide uh, which particular case would you like to use iris hooks? And which are those cases where you like to have expanders? Do you have a, some sort of a, a definition? Which case, what type of procedure should be done? Okay, so definitely, you know, if you are not a frequent user of the Mulligan ring, right, you don't want to try on a very, very small stuck pupil because as you saw the disaster, even though I've used so many of these devices, all right, it can be really very, very difficult uh, to do this with a Mulligan ring in a small pupil. Now, some of these irises do not stretch well, even if you have released them from the sinicare, and so don't use uh, a Malukin ring change to iris hooks. If you have a very shallow anterior chamber, the Malukin ring takes up space. So you also uh, want to use iris hooks. And of course, if you are worried that the, the iris will not be able to dilate nicely because it's been uh, chronically inflamed and there can be fibrosis, then you use again iris hooks because it's very good in that you can titrate the size of the pupil. You can slowly expand it bit by bit. And you know, the Malukin. Uh, the, the iris hook can actually allow you to expand one area more than the other, which is not what you can do with the Mulligan ring. So, you know, I, I think especially for the uveitic eyes where the pupil has been stuck and adherent for a long time, and if you're not a frequent user, please use the hooks. They are so much safer to use. Absolutely. So there is a position for hooks even now as we speak. So a lot of us... I think in Dr. Tityal's practice, he does it without anything. In <laughs> most cases. <laughs> but, uh, well, I showed you the first case. You know, I thought it was fine. Definite but it indications wasn't. for <laughs> using hooks also, like uh, floppy iris cases, where you uh, proceed with surgery and subsequently the pupil constricts. There, putting uh, devices can be very difficult sometimes because you're going to Agreed. hook uh, you know, underneath structures also. In those cases, I think iris hooks are better, especially struggling with toric eyewells where the pupil constricts towards the end of surgery and you don't know mm -hmm. where you have to you know, put your access or toric eyewells. So I find these iris hooks a uh, great help in that situation. Agree. Yeah. It's a very so interesting. Sorry. Yes, please. Like a little uh, picture frame. So, you know, sometimes you can actually move it to one side or to another side, you know, so that you can actually uh, focus on, say, the the toric marks for an RL. So you can still use it as a picture frame, you know, if you had a toric implant. And uh, Boris has actually shown his ability to suture the ring to the side where the center of the RL, uh, of the, the subluxated lens is, so that he could do femto. So that's brilliant as well. You can't do that with iris hooks sticking out with femto. Yeah. One very interesting question, and I think I'll put that forward to uh, Dr. Partha here. Dr. Partha, if you can answer shallow chamber and small pupil. In these cases, what exact trick can we use because they are struggling with that or uh, one situation? So uh, remembering the fact that if it is a shallow chamber, the OVD is the first device that has to be used. So with the OVD, if the shallowness is good enough and can be improved, then the rings can definitely go in. The rings actually take up space, as uh, Professor Chi also said. If in case the viscoelastic has not been able to deepen the chamber to a proper limit, then the hooks are again the best to be used. Fantastic. Yeah, in shallow, shallow interior chambers, less than maybe 2.5 or so, uh, hooks are the preferred ones because, you know, there have been studies around in which they say that the endothelial cell loss somehow is more with a uh, ring that, rather than with the hooks and uh, they take up more space. So that is uh, one thing which should be definitely taken into consideration. Dr. Namrata and Dr. Jeevan, if you could answer anybody, uh, 
what are the other instruments out there for small pupil management? I mean, we've seen iris hooks and malugin ring in this uh, scenario, but are there any other instruments and are they good enough for doing? And this is the question that has come. So. Others are there, like you know, there's a one which we, which came was OS pu, OS's pupil expander, and there was yet another one, of course, from Dr. Subin, but I think Dr. Subin, at some point. Yeah, Dr. Sovin was, yeah. was the one who, you know, who gave his B hex ring, which has gone more, undergone several uh, modifications as well, and which is quite good also. Uh, only thing is, is, I find it a little more flexible than the other devices. So that is the only thing, but you have to get used to it. And that's also a good, a good device. Sir would like to add something to it. Oh, as, as Rohit said, you know, uh, I'm not very fond of uh, using devices, <laughs> but yes, I have used uh, uh, Melugin rings uh, effectively and BX also. And I thank uh, thank uh, to uh, Subin that he made me uh, to look into his devices in a few in the sequence of developments. And sometimes they are very e effective and useful. And devices which are not very bulky and they are softer and they can be injected to the you know 2.2 incision should be used in these cases. And Subin so uh, uh, VX rings I've used in a shallow chamber also it goes very nicely inside to the 2.2 right. and you can uh, effectively do the surgery. So as rightly said by Dr. Parsa, I think you need to get used to uh, these devices uh, correctly before you know jumping into uh, one particular thing. One I'd like to highlight to the viewers and the audience. Whenever we make a side post for putting these hooks, we have to be a little careful uh, not to do a two anterior incision for side post because if you have a two anterior incision, that will tend the iris uh, uh, up and you can have more damage to the iris structure. If you are a little parallel to the iris plane, that is a little posterior limbal incision, that will make sure you don't tend the iris tissue. And this will be also very effective for uh, uh, when you stabilize the lens also. You have a little posterior incision and you are parallel to the, uh, uh, the tissue. Last question to Dr. John, if you could answer this, sir, uh, and then I'll move to my presentation. So if you could also make me a uh, presenter, guys, team. Uh, Dr. John, do you perform pupiloplasty at the end of these, uh, uh, you know, in these difficult maneuvers, whenever you stretch the pupil or you're having a ring inside, sometimes the thing becomes atonic. Do you do a pupiloplasty? I do that before I start, but when I'm done, I, I don't because I think uh, with the Malugan ring and with the eyes retractor, it should be pretty well uh, expanded. And uh, if you're free of adhesions, when the pupil comes down, it's really not a problem. Uh, so I don't do it at the end, but I do it in the beginning. Um, it does make the putting in the Malugan ring a lot easier. Sometimes I even do a little bit of sphincterotomy as well. I do have one little advice is you can see uh, Dr. Chi did a beautiful job. One of the things when you're struggling with everything, watch out for the anterior capsule. The last thing you want to do is to cause a tear in the anterior capsule because you don't realize that until you start doing the CCC. And then, you know, you, you have problems putting the, the lens in everything. So, you know, float the iris up quite a bit with viscoelastic and you can, you can even work on it. But really, you know, keep your mind, don't get too carried away with the iris. Keep your mind on the anterior capsule, it's very important. Because one time I actually caused a tear in the anterior capsule and it got me into all kinds of trouble. Right. Okay, thank you panel, thank you speakers for your presentations. And I'll move to my presentation now. Mine is on managing complications of cataract, but uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit, uh, two different topics and I'll just go quickly into it. One of them is a, complications that I received from somewhere else. So a uh, patient was basically, he came to me with a capsule of phimosis of this, like this in an almost dislocating format. Uh, initially, I thought I'll just, uh, you know, take that IOL and just glue it into place after taking out the bag around it. Came with the post-operative refraction of 2200. If you can see, that's right in the center of the pupil. That patient's not going to be seeing very well. Uh, I made my marks at 180 uh, degrees. I've made a partial thickness flap on one side and then the other side, 180 degrees apart, if you can see the flaps. Next, what I'm doing here is making a trocar AC maintainer entry to have my infusion inside. 
once I have infusion inside, I make two side ports. That's it. Just two side ports in the corneal, clear corneal wound. Uh, ensure that I'm free of any viscoelastic. I first try and remove any, uh, take out this, nick that bag, but I was not able to do so. But so what I did is eventually went and held that optic, uh, the optic edge. But while I was doing that, if you see on the side periphery, there is a huge endocapsular ring on the peripheral of the bag. So this owing to the fact that now I have to change my strategy, not just to glue the lens in, but also to remove that endocapsular ring in place along with the bag. So now I'm making my sclerotomies. And once I've made my sclerotomies, I'm using a modified PAL technique to kind of hold and grasp that optic edge. Once I've grabbed that optic edge in place, I'm doing a vitrectomy through the sclerotomy entries that I've made along with the limbal entries. So once this is done, I first found my part where I can grab that endocapsular ring. Now watch what I'm doing here. I'm holding that optic of the lens very, very tightly and removing this endocapsular ring. At this point, I'm feeling very proud that I've held the endocapsular ring and now I'm doing my uh, vitrectomy through the side port, uh, through the side port. While I was doing this, I'm also now going back and oops, I've dropped my lens inside. So this is a big problem in, in this case. What do I do? Sometimes fortune favors the brave. I'm actually trying to push my trocar in. If you see what I'm trying to do, I'll just show this in a replay of sorts. I'm trying to push my trocar in, but now what happens? Watch this. I'm putting my trocar in, but at the end, what's happening is infusion is actually coming out. Fluid is coming out of the main port wound or the side port wound, which I had created. And that is allowing a convection current inside the eye. That's how, because it's already a vitrectomized eye now, it allowed my intraocular lens to come back into space. Now, I'm grabbing this with dear hands and with kid gloves to ensure nothing happens at this point of time. Once this is done, I can externalize both the haptics, my endocapsular ring out. I can externalize both haptics. Remember, these PMMA lenses are one of the best lenses that you can glue into place. The reason why I say that is because the, they have a bulbous end to it and that bulbous end kind of sticks very well into place when it goes into the haptic, when the haptic goes into the tunnel, the Bosch Chariot's tunnel. Now I'm using a vitrectomy cutter to cut off any bag remnant that is attached to any vitreous component over there. Once this is done, I really have a good round. Now I have all my bag remnants out. I'm trying to make sure that my pupil is round enough if you don't, nowadays I also do a pupiloplasty of sorts. There was some amount of vitreous which I did go back and remove. And post that, you can actually go ahead and remove all the trocars, close that flap, close that glue, close it with glue. And this probably is the end of this. Patient was 612 post operatively. I'm going to show you another case and then we will take all the questions as is. So this is a very interesting case as well. This was a product devised by Dr. Susan Jacob, but it found relevance even in a... So here's a case where you have a deformed bag inferiorly. The zonules are intact, and we see this quite often actually. Zonules are intact. I'm making my rexis just like how I would. Only thing I tend to be a little bit, little bit away from the... Uh, this thing, I try to make it as central as possible. Once I've done that, I'm making my, I've done my hydro dissection and it's a very soft lens, so I don't really need to use much high power. What I'm trying to show here is I'm getting away with cataract surgery, even in a case of subluxation like this. Uh, now, I said to myself, you know what, I'm just going to place a lens inside, IOL inside and see what happens. Uh, but that's not going to be enough. So I'm going to place an endocapsular ring first so i place my endocapsular ring into the bag and just in interest of time i'm going to go forward not show the uh, ring once my endocapsular ring is in place i place a three piece lens i always place a three piece lens in these cases nowadays because in case they have to be switched over to a complex scenario or a complication i can always glue that same lens in place as i showed in the previous case now i'm trying to see whether this 
people, it's not centered. And I know Dr. Jeevan is looking at me and saying, boss, don't leave it like this. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually ensuring to see that, you know, I'm not happy. So now what I have to do is actually ensure that I can bring that bag back into its place. So what I'm doing here is putting a glued capsule or a paper clip hook that was devised by Dr. Susan Jacob. It's by company Morsha. I have no financial interest in any of them. Uh, but here, what I'm doing is making a sclerotomy under the flap, but in the sulcus space. Remember, I'm in the sulcus space, not in the posterior segment. And I've also made my gebol chariots tunnel. Why am I making a sclerotomy and a gebol chariots tunnel is because the device which I'm going to be using needs no sutures at the end. So what this does is a distal end goes and holds. I hold that distal end and the proximal end looks something like this. Once I've externalized that distal end, I ensure that this paper clip, it looks like a paper clip so that edge goes below the anterior chamber, uh, anterior capsule rim. And once I've pulled enough, if you can see clearly how it was to how it is pre-operated, now I tuck that other distal end into the hap into the Gebor Sharia channel and voila, I have a centralized IOL bag complex with an epic capsular thing. So what, how this helped me is without any vitrectomy, without any sclerotomy, without any infusion or any sort of vitrectomy procedure, I was able to attain a central uh, pupil. And this is the one week post-operative of the same patient. Wanted to show this case because I thought this is a complication which we all might face. And how do you come out of this in certain scenarios? And I will be willing to take some questions. Uh, before that, any comments uh, from the panel in terms of how you would handle the first scenario? I think that's more interesting in terms of we all get those capsular phimosis and decentered bags and subluxated IOLs. So how do you handle them? I would love all the panel from starting from the, Dr. Jeevan, if you could uh, start with your comments on that. I think everybody wants to know subluxation and how do you handle these subluxated IOLs? Yeah, Ashwin uh, beautifully shown uh, the technique of uh, fixing the uh, PMMA lens. But we uh, we know that cases with uh, uveitis, cases with pseudo exploration, they would have these things uh, happening in a uh, immediate past, maybe within a two or five years down the line. And most of the time, the fibrosis and the, the weakness of genus is going to cause uh, bag dialysis in these cases. And uh, nowadays, uh, we do put uh, CTR in case with a pseudo exploration And these are difficulties which younger people might face subsequently after 10 years or so. And that may make things difficult. So what I would uh, appreciate uh, the younger generation to make sure if you have a blue genules or disease uh, process like uh, uh, degenerative conditions, maybe uh, with the knowledge of having a good results with fixations, the primary surgery can be fixation in such cases so that we don't have to have a second procedure like this to happen because these procedures are not uh, free of uh, difficulties or complications. I would advise people, especially the case you showed that uh, the reverse fluid uh, current happening in the vitreous cavity, then getting the entire bag out would have some turbulence in the uh, posterior segment also. So towards the end of surgery, you need to assess the periphery and see if there's any point or dialysis or tear which can which has to be taken care of at that stage or maybe subsequently within a you know next 24 hours it's must for all uh, these difficult cases so in my right. uh, hand i would have done a almost similar procedure maybe i would have taken the entire bag complex out because i may not be very you know confident to fix this lens uh, rigid uh, haptic lens and ship to a routine uh, uh, the multi-page foldable lens and refix those cases and I've seen people uh, doing a retro fixation also with uh, very good results. I have not done the, those cases, but yes, I would have gone for the entire bag removal, done a good vitrectomy, and gone for a you know, skill fixation of a multi piece IOA. Fantastic. Thank you. Dr. John, would you want to comment on this, Dr. John? Yes, I, I'm uh, also more conservative. I probably would take the whole complex out as well and do a, a glued fixation of an IOL. Uh, in this situation, you can even glue an I, a multifocal three-piece IOL. One thing about um, putting that into the 
uh, what you do in a scroll tunnel, the PMMA haptics, they tend to be very brittle. So they can break very easily. So you have to be extra and ultra careful. Whereas with the, with, you know, with, with the uh, three piece, they're, they're a little bit more forgiving. So I think that's my advice. Dr. Chi, do you have any comments for this on this? You showed surgery beautifully and you handled it very well. Um, I think I would have explanted the LL and um, done a Yamani technique for intrascleroheptic fixation. Yeah, that's it. Dr. Pato, would your comments be on yeah. this? Ashwin, uh, this was absolutely level three of difficulty <laughs> in the situation because not only was there a PMMA, but it was a fibrous capsule and also you had the CTR in place. So removing the bag with the CTR and the uh, PMMA lens would have been the easiest way out. Of course, you have handled it extremely well because of the expertise you have you have for handling these cases. But again, if one is conservative, one takes out that whole bag CTR and lens complex and then goes in with a fixation of a three-piece lens and uh, that is a blue dye well. So that is uh, how I would also have handled it. Dr. Gaurav has kept quiet for a long time. I would like to ask his opinion as well in sublimated yeah. IOS. So Ashwin, I think you did a great job of handling it because you know it requires uh, a, a very tactful surgeon to actually get away with uh, what you did. So beautifully shown, and you know all of us who aspire to learn these new techniques would do really well. And as the other surgeons have all mentioned that you know the conservative way. So for a surgeon who may not have brilliant skills as uh, you know that what some top surgeon may have, he may probably find it much easier to go back and you know, remove the bag. But all the same, you know you've shown an amazing way to do it. Now, one thing which I would like to add in addition to what everybody said is that for capsular phimosis, I would suggest that for uh, and for most of us cataract surgeons, you know, typically it's those unhealthy capsules where you're almost, you're, you know, you're already aware that this may go into a capsular phimosis. So watch them uh, more often in the first 15, 20 days or a month. You start seeing those changes happening like those pseudo exfoliation capsules or some of these others and do the relaxing YAG incisions to break that phimosis in the early stage itself. That really helps, you know, and I tend to watch on the 10th or 15th, they put a drop of cycloplegic to see that some of those patients are not getting a bit of a phimosis and catch them early so that they don't reach the stage where, you know, you will have all kinds of, you know, uh, circus going around inside the bag and, you know, this bag moving to one side. So I think uh, that's another thing which we can do to prevent uh, these situations from happening. Dr. Jeevan? Uh, Ashwin, yes. I'd just like Thank to add you. one thing. Recently, I reviewed a very interesting uh, uh, procedure for uh, these cases where you have uh, early phimosis happening in these cases. And the surgeon had taken this patient for a femtosecond laser uh, recapsulotomy to enlarge the capsulotomy for uh, almost 5.5 millimeter, okay. taken out the piece. I found that a very interesting and uh, and they showed that there were no uh, significant fibrosis. So you have to pick up cases a little early, which uh, Dr. Gaurav is saying, and you can do this procedure, very interesting one. Yeah, I think that's that really interesting. Interesting. people should done it well. Can and I just add the thing? tip? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. So, you know, instead of taking out the RL together with the CTR, which has a large chip, so I will hold onto the CTR and move it hand over hand until I reach the CTR uh, begins or ends. Uh, Dr. Ashwin, can I add? I'll use the scissors yeah. to just snip on the bag and then get hold of the CTR and pull it out of the bag. So that will reduce the size of your incision when you take the RL out. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, doc Dr. Rohit, you had a comment to make? Ashwin, can I add some? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, anterior capsular polishing is also a very important factor in these patients because that yeah. will decrease the capsular contraction by all means. So anterior capsular polishing, uh, in addition to what Dr. Gaurav has said, uh, sh these are the two additional things which uh, you know should be taken into consideration. So I'd like to add one small thing, uh, Ashwin. Mm -hmm. uh, I had published this technique uh, almost 15 years back where uh, in uh, smaller uh, capsular axis or uh, cases, especially pediatric, you know, viatic patient, towards the end of surgery, I do a multiple uh, incision onto the axis. So it makes a, a posted stamp type of appearance. So this increases the size as, as well and decreases the chance of phimosis. 
If somebody yeah. can read, this is a JCRS uh, almost 50 years back. Uh, beautiful I concept. remember 15 years back, we had not yeah. drawn a schematic diagram also for this. To show this. <laughs> but that's a very good concept. It gives both. It enlarges the axis uh, size and decreases and the forces because you break the circle. Dr. Namrata, do you want to add last few comments on this question no, before think, we move uh, on? We have a lot of questions. I think, come yeah, in. I, think I, I would do very much the same way as Dr. Chang. I would remove the whole thing and then do a blue dial for this. Perfect. All right. But of course, uh, you, are a, you are a gifted surgeon, so you can get away with anything. Very nice surgery, Ashwin. Very nicely case managed. Yeah, very nicely managed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have close to around 500 people actually viewing on the go to webinar site right now. And uh, we, we have, they have a lot of questions coming forward from for all speakers. So I'll just go uh, one by one, which the questions which I missed in the earlier part. Uh, so do you measure? I, I think I can point it out to one by one and each one can answer. Uh, do you measure contrast sensitivity in all your patients of premium IOL and why and so on and so forth? Dr. John, if you want to answer that yeah um, well we do a pentacam on all our patients and on the pentacam there is a higher order aberration and spherical aberration now most pentacam actually they advise that if your spherical aberration is more than 0 0.3 you shouldn't put it in but we've been we've put in people with you know 0 0.5 and as you know post basic patients the spherical aberration is much worse and they seem to do well so i think a lot of it is pre-op uh, uh, preparation, like uh, Dr. Uh, Gurap was saying, you got to lower the expectation and you got to tell them they're going to have halo, they're going to glare, and they really have to be quite keen on being spectral and independent. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jeevan, if you can help me answer this one, this is a very interesting one. If a patient is below 20 and above 70, uh, is the premium IOL suited for them or no? And why? I'll take it, you know, if somebody is above 70 and doesn't have the posterior segment problems like a macular degeneration or a scar or a diabetic changes or a long-standing glaucoma and they have a normal anatomy, yes, they are the people who will benefit best. In fact, I'll go, go for a more of a higher ad for these people because they'll be more of a reading and a near work. Maybe I can go five focal and give them a plus three, plus four ad. If they have a golfing type of attitude, then maybe trifocal for these patients. But I think the posterior segment assessment and the uh, other features should be need to be checked for uh, older patients. For younger patients, less than 20, uh, if most of them will be maybe a unilocular cataracts like uh, trauma or uh, other causes. If there's a trauma, yes, uh, other eye will be normal. In such cases, uh, maybe trifocal will be best at today's generation or the newer thinking of uh, you know uh, increasing the uh, 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 enhanced upper lens which gives you a depth of focus and gives a near vision doesn't compromise the distant vision maybe good for a younger generation patients i'm waiting for a future developments of trifocal in combination with you know spherical uh, uh, aberration change in the lens in the central optics Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Uh, anybody can answer this question because it's more yeah, specific. I, I have, can I say something? Um, for the younger ones, they usually have cataracts. Um, so their vision is already compromised. They're used to the glare and the halos. And I find that if I put a multifocal IO, they adapt very, very quickly. They hardly ever complain because already their vision is compromised. For the yeah. elderly, I agree very much uh, with Dr. Titiao. Uh, but the mo more elderly, maybe. 80 or above, most of them are very small pupils. So they already have very good depth of focus. So they may not actually need um, uh, 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 a multifocal IOL or something, you know. So so I may just put an EDOF or something, maybe in a monofocal. Uh, but be careful. Uh, I have some surgeons doing monovision on these patients. And the problem is these elderly don't do too well when they have anisometropia. And if they fall, the wheelchair bound and then you're in big trouble so you know I, I one i one thing i do want is do not do monovision on these elderly patients mm. right thank you thanks for that comment dr john that was uh, excellent tip there uh, how many of you have done punctorexis and what is the setting on punctorexis i personally have not done i'm going to direct him to dr mohan rajan if 
none of us over here have done panchorex we don't do i haven't done any panchorexes okay i think that's the answer because so rohit prakash must have done because he's demonstrated panchorexes dr rohit is not there yeah yeah i just I lost the connection what was the question sorry for that madam uh, panchorex what is the scope for sorry how often Hello. do you do panchorexes and no, what are the I, settings for it i just uh, uh, did it in two three cases because dr mohan rajan was uh, really talking about it so uh, i do not use i use a longitudinal uh, mode in this i have a, i use a use an ozil for that matter but i don't uh, use the ozil i use the longitudinal mode uh, zero degree tip is required which is rarely available uh, with the uh, the alcon people but i tried it with the 31 and then you know you go uh, with around 250 to 300 uh, vacuum and floor it and just go in pu- push the foot switch to foot switch 3 fully and then you know back but uh, in uh, one of the cases i had a problem so i just stopped doing it i i have a handy with me all other procedures so panchorex is by all means as of now i hope dr mohan rajan is not listening to me So yeah. that is as of all. <laughs> I think that's a. Yeah, that is a technique specific for him. That's a technique. You know, in fact, Uday Devgan has described it long back. I saw Uday Devgan's videos more than ten, fifteen years back, doing this and you know, kind of showing it. But I think it's a very poorly controlled technique. Risk of complications is very high. I would not suggest this to any surgeon to kind of do that when we have better alternative techniques. For me today, I think femto-assisted is my first choice. Even if the patient, I have to even if I have to like like really absorb the cost and cut down the cost for them. You know, I will do everything possible to kind of bring them to a femto-assisted surgery. Maybe not even have any kind of income from that patient. yet a second choice uh, for me would be all the things that he said but what i typically do is use good viscoelastic and go and decompress the lens from an independent paracentesis which means like you know if, if fill up the bag uh, fill up the ac with good viscoelastic have a tight chamber go in with a 26 gauge needle from a new port like a, you know new uh, thing entering into the chamber and puncture the bag and decompress it and then come back and finish the excess with a side port never from the main port i think these are the two most important things that i would do because your yeah, anterior chamber uh, pressure has to be maintained by all means that's the most important click and when you puncture it at the same time you have to you know aspirate aspirate it because if you give some time yes. it will spread to the periphery so it has to be uh, practically instantaneous yes. for that matter perfect yes. so the moment you enter it you know you can just kind of keep aspirating and uh, decompress the lens and then fill in more viscoelastic and make sure you're not doing any maneuver from the existing ports the main port or the side port till you have decompressed the lens yeah, absolutely one, right yeah dr partha one question to you would be uh, how do you stop bleeding during uh, releasing a pas or a peripheral anterior synecia when you're releasing it can you stop how do you stop what are the maneuvers that you tricks that you can give okay uh, so when we are removing the pas uh, so there is definitely going to be bleeding uh, we need to be prepared for that so filling the anterior chamber with viscoelastic high molecular weight viscoelastic is the only way and uh, it works quite well and okay. once uh, the, uh, this has to be replenished time and again and uh, once it is replenished if it is torrential bleeding uh, that means that something beyond the pas has occurred and maybe there's been an iris dialysis uh, but usually with the high molecular viscoelastic it stops if it does not stop and if it is coming in gushes out then again uh, tightening the anterior chamber and waiting a little time for it to stop is uh, what we need to do also you can Thank put intracameral adrenaline i mean that also kind of uh, reduces uh, may and also, or if you put air bubble there and you allow it to sit for some time there then that also kind of takes care of bleeding fantastic thank you thank, thank you, you dr patra thank you dr namrata one uh, question more which i will take i think this is more towards uh, me and then i think dr Su- dr chief you can answer this as do you use prior uh, pass plana vitrectomy in shallow chambers if yes what are the parameters you use so i i'd like to mention that i had published this for not just shallow chambers but for most cases where you have aqueous misdirection or any kind of positive pressure uh, it is called as vitrectomy assisted phaco uh, where we are basically doing a dry vitrectomy for less than 6 to 7 seconds 
uh, I, and I know the the risks involved in it and I know that I'm very comfortable in the vitreous so I can do it. I would not recommend somebody from an anterior chamber person to probably do this. But uh, it's worked very well for me, not just in these cases of uh, uh, shallow chambers, but also in cases where you have intumescent cataracts, where you have coloboma cataracts. During the case where the saline is going behind and hydrating that vitreous, making your positive pressure more, uh, we've all done iris hooks, we've all done rings, we've all done capsule tension rings, but honestly, they are not the cause, they're not removing the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is behind the lens. And the minute I started approaching it from the from the back, putting a trocar and just doing a seven second uh, vitrectomy at 1500 cut rate, uh, it elevates all my problems. Instead, it makes it so much easier. I get a clear cornea because I get a nice deep chamber now. Only thing, do not do it for too long, and do not do it uh, if you don't. If you have a thick black cataract or a white cataract where you can't see your port, you must be able to see your port. That's the only uh, advice that I would give. Doctor Chi, if you could, uh, uh, which uh, uh, Ashwin is also advocated in phacomorphic cases where you have phacomorphic uh, uh, glaucoma. And this was a pub paper which was published by Dr. Tanush Dada from OP Center where he's done past pena vitrectomy just prior to doing these cases so that your chambers become a little deeper. Okay, so I think, uh, first of all, I clarify, I'm an anterior segment surgeon. But anterior segment surgeons can also learn these uh, approaches, right, because it involves uh, the cataract. So I do encounter cases of uh, Phacomorphic glaucomas, especially um, when you have also lens subluxation due to weak zonules. Right? So the lens can be really very, very anterior, and in addition, it can be extremely thick. All right, and patients who are post-angle closure glaucoma, they, they don't come to you until they're, you know, we, we see lenses that are over 6 mm thick. And so if you want to uh, do this, first of all, you have to look at the axial length. Now, you don't really want to do this in an anatomic eye because you don't know where the past picata, where the past planar is. But in a normal exit length or slightly short exit length eye, it would still be safe to do. And uh, I like to use a trocar cannula, although you can do it just by reflecting the conjunctiva and using a, a MVR blade and go in. But what I want to uh, suggest is that instead of you know going straight to the center of the globe, like what we have often been taught, I always aim towards where I imagine the optic nerve to be. Because very often the cases that I encounter that require this maneuver are in cases where they are really very, very white cataracts and I have no view of the uh, the back of the eye and where my trocar is really. So I, I just aim towards the optic nerve and I think it's still fairly safe. Uh, you know, it would be good actually if you had a UBM to see exactly wh where the lens is right, how thick it is so that you know where to aim before you do the procedure. And uh, how much to remove? Okay, first of all, the, the, the cut rate would be between 1,000 to 2,000 cut rates. You can use a 25 gauge, although mostly I've been using 23 gauge uh, um, retractor, about 300 right. uh, uh, mmHg for vacuum. And how much to remove? I put my other finger on the globe and I'm exerting uh, gentle pressure and as I cut I feel the globe all right and I, I palpate it with my other finger to see whether the pressure has softened and whether I, I would be able to deepen the chamber. Now if I, I've stopped doing the vitrectomy and I find that I cannot adequately deepen the chamber and put it in enough viscoelastic to do the surgery safely, I can always go back to that, that troca cannula there and reinsert and cut a little more. All right, but the problem is that if you've cut too much and you have zonular weakness, all right, when you put in your infusion, your, your lens will be really deep into the eye. And well, not all is lost. You can always go back to that trocar cannula and refill with some BSS. And if you do have misdirection of fluid during the procedure, you can again go in and take some fluid out. And if you're doing a procedure, say you're trying to put a needle in because you want to fixate, you know, your, your loose zonules and you need to firm up the eye, it's not a good idea to keep pumping the scholastic in the front of the eye. What I do is I put BSS through that troca cannula to firm up the eye from the back. So it's very useful to have a troca cannula, not just a sclerostomy, to control exactly where the lens position is going to be. It's going to make it useful for whichever procedure you're taking on. 
Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chi. That was excellent few tips that you've given there. I think we have a couple of more questions, two more questions, and then we'll close this uh, session. But uh, unless somebody wants to make another comment or something. But I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, Dr. Rohit or anybody can answer this. How can we know that an Argentinian flag sign goes to the posterior capsule? How do we, what is the science to denote that? And what do you do in those scenarios? Yeah, well, that's uh, the flap motility sign. So right. if it happens to be, you know, you, you know, what has happened is this has been there right from the day Kalman started vacuum because then, you know, the capsular axis was not there. What I'm trying to put forth is that we have been focusing only on the FACO probe or the IAF tip. So mm -hmm. you just have to widen your vision and see what the type of the flap is. If by any means the flap is averted and fluttering, this means that it is pre-equatorial. And the moment it goes beyond and becomes a wraparound tear, in other words, it becomes a post-equatorial tear, it stops fluttering and becomes inverted. So this appears much before the classical signs of, uh, you know, posterior capsule rupture. So that is the end point where you should inflate and convert. And uh, that is how we come to know the extent of the Argentinian flags, uh, the yeah, Argentinian flag sign, Argentinian flag, yeah, uh, for that matter. Right. Uh, Dr. John or Dr. Partha, anybody, if you can answer this, please comment about subcapsular dissection of fibrotic capsule. On the what dissection? Subcapsular Sub dissection of fibrotic capsule of a fibrotic capsule. Yeah, uh, how to dissect a fibrotic capsule? Uh, In the sub well, subcapsular. Uh, sub subcapsular dissection. Yeah. Presumably it's okay. under the anterior capsule, right? I'm thinking yeah. under an anterior capsule, of course. Yeah, I think you you use um, like forceps, very fine forceps. You know, obviously you fill up with uh, viscoelastic and you go behind right. and you, you you grab on where you think the fibrosis is and just gently tease that and see if you can, you know, I don't actually dissect it. I actually gently pull it, but radially in towards the center rather than to the side or off. That way you could tear the tear. It. But then you don't want to pull too hard because you may break the zonules. Yeah, Deepak Magur has come out with a beautiful presentation. You know, what he does is with all these uh, barks, he takes a dissector and goes beneath it, beneath the anterior capsule, and tries to create a plane. And then he dissects it. He uses a bimanual forceps for that matter and holds it and, you know, just tears it. Dr. Chi has, uh, you know, really, Dr. Chi, these fibrotic ones, they usually do not extend to the posterior capsule and beyond. So I think uh, FACO emulsification can be continued in such cases, but dissection and using, uh, you know, bimanual forceps can help to take it. And you can use visco also to go beneath the, where you create a plane, you take a visco cannula and eject. So that will also further help to do that. The other things you can do is femtosecond laser, increasing the yeah. energy for the capsulotomy. And of course, if there's, you know, you just cut through the capsule and then you leave the strand, you can just use intraocular scissors and just snip it off. You don't have Thank to you. remove the fibrosis. Yeah, you can actually just cut around it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Namrata, last question and we'll close it for here from here. Uh, role of multiple sclerotomy, uh, sphincterotomies for very small pupil, do you choose Multiple sphincterotomies or iris hooks, how, which direction do you go and how? Multiple sphincterotomies uh, would be the last choice and I would, I have not done it for years now, although long time ago we used to say that as an option. But uh, if, if you have a small pupil, best is to use nylon hooks and before that there's always a membrane on it. So that can be removed, the Osher's membrane, you can try to remove that. But even if you use the nylon hooks or any of the device which dilates the pupil and when you actually remove it, then it kind of never comes back to the same uh, meiotic size as it was there previously because the, the devices would have, you know, slightly enlarged or stretched the pupil uh, without, uh, without you having realized it. So it will never come back to the same pinpoint one millimeters uh, because it would have stretched because of the nylon hooks or because of the malugan ring 
etc so with the availability of these good devices i don't think sphincterotomies is a great idea because once you do it then even phaco becomes a problem and then the tags of the the iris keep coming on to the phaco or the eye probe ashwin can i chip in with something here yes please yeah, so what Namrata said is absolutely right. That would be the last resort. And typically, you know, in eyes with a very, very tight, small pupil, which is really rigid, uh, you know, I would not go with one of the rings, actually, because it's sometimes difficult and the stretch will be phenomenal. I would go with iris hooks, get a little bit of a, you know, dilation first, and then gently kind of tug on each hook at a time, like four hooks, and, you know, gradually try to get a pupil which is not too large. Don't aim for a very large pupil. Aim for a mid-sized pupil, which is just enough for you to get in, you know, like a 4 mm pupil is good enough to actually do your surgery. That way you are going to damage all the sphincter and have a big pupil later on. And, uh, you know, the rings are probably not a great idea in such situations where you are expecting a very tight or, a you know, rigid pupil. Iris hooks with a moderate dilation is good enough, I think. Right. Can I just chip in? Yes, please, sir. Yeah. So, um, Professor Chi showed a very nice uh, uh, way of uh, very elegantly doing a small pupil rexis, a small pupil management. So, the peeling of the membrane on the pupil will at definitely damage some amount of the sphincter. And if it is a very small one, like what Professor Chi was dealing with, the possibility of uh, supporting with another uh, Y hook while the peeling is going on is very important so that gives the counter effect or the counter traction onto the movement of the peeling of that membrane so that becomes once that is done then usually these uveitic pupils open up to 5 5.5 even and then adequate viscoelastic it stretches out a little more and these pupils usually will not shrink at all during the course of the surgery which is different from the atonic pupils or the ones with uh, the ifis perfect thank you everybody uh, and i wanted to close this session with first of all thanking my panel uh, dr namrata dr partha and dr john for being here, for being present, and completely being with me full time. Uh, my speaker is very, very important, uh, Dr. Gaurav, uh, Dr. Rohit, Dr. Soon, and most important, Dr. Jeevan, for uh, chairing this session and helping me in uh, organizing this session. Uh, I also wanted to uh, end with uh, ISRS is going to be having a, a, another webinar very, very soon on 5th of May on demystifying fake ICLs and John Chang and myself will be uh, the moderators there. We have, and he's also speaking in that ISRS session. Uh, we also have Dr. Rob, Bob Maloney from US and Eric Mertens from Belgium. They'll be talking on different topics such as fake uh, patient selection, say sizing of fake IL, uh, fake ICL implantation to know more and complication and managing these challenging cases. To know more of this, uh, please just follow me on Instagram or YouTube or any of these channels and I'll be happy to share more information on this personally. But uh, please be there 5th of uh, May, 9 p.m. Uh, India time. And you can calculate that in your respective countries, guys. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Namaste is the new hello. So here you go. Namaste. Thank you, Ashwin. <laughs> Uh, thank thanks, you. Uh, thanks, Ashwin. Ashwin. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John and T and Bye -bye. Baka and thank you. Uh, Great Namrata. Talk. Yes, thank you. and Zeiss as well for helping us organize this. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. sir from from Zeiss side, I would like to thank all of you, sir, for uh, I mean accepting our request and especially to Dr. Ashwin for helping us and being patient with us in uh, conducting this webinar. And uh, we would like to do uh, more with uh, you again. And so thanks to all the panelists and uh, we uh, uh, thank you for your valuable uh, uh, discussions and the audience as I can see the questions, there were a lot of questions. So it was really the 50-50 webinar which it was planned. So a lot of uh, audience questions got answered and thanks to all and be safe. And again, namaste to all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Very well conducted, Ashwin. Yeah. Very yeah, good. Great job, Ashwin. Thank you, guys. Congratulations, Dr. Yeah. Great job, Ashwin.